Welcome to Epoch News, I'm Tatiana Darzi. China has been listed as a country of particular concern for serious violations of religious freedoms for 21 consecutive years. The Chinese Communist Party is cited for using technology, such as face recognition cameras and artificial intelligence, to spy on religious groups. The CCP has also exported this technology to other countries to undermine religious freedoms on an international scale. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom published its annual report on Tuesday, announcing that China is listed as a country of particular concern for serious violations of religious freedom for the 21st consecutive year. The chairman of the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, Tony Perkins, stated, The evidence is overwhelming that China abuses human rights on a systematic basis, and religious freedom is chief among the targets. According to reports, the situation of religious freedom in China continued to deteriorate in 2019. The Chinese Communist Party constructed a country with a high-technology surveillance system that uses facial recognition and artificial intelligence to spy on religious groups. We see Falun Gong, which is another uh, religious minority that is suppressed in, in China, in fact, linked to uh, forced organ harvesting. What I have seen very reliable, uh, that that's become big business in China, and it's primarily through these political religious prisoners that this is taking place. The report mentioned particularly the CCP's pressure on the United Nations and foreign governments and the exporting of surveillance technology and systems training to more than 100 countries to undermine religious freedom on an international level. And that's extremely important to understand because some of this technology has been facilitated by American companies. Now it's being exported from China now that it's been perfected. The report made several recommendations to the U.S. government, including sanctions against CCP agencies and Chinese officials that have been a part of serious violations of religious freedom. Some of these include seizing personal assets or banning entry to the U.S., also naming Chen Chuanguo, who is currently the Communist Party Secretary of Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region, Zhu Hailun, former Deputy Party Secretary of the Xinjiang Uyghur Autonomous Region. To counteract the CCP's influence, the U.S. government has reinforced its diplomatic efforts. In January 2020, the Department of State appointed Mark Lambert as special envoy to counter the CCP's malicious influence at the UN. A senator of the Czech Republic died last January from a heart attack. Before that, the senator had received two threatening letters over a planned visit to Taiwan. The letters were discovered in the briefcase by his wife and daughter when they were sorting through his belongings. The Chinese ambassador to the Czech Republic, together with the country's pro-Beijing president, are being accused by bereaved family members of threatening the late Senate president of the Czech Republic and of causing his death, citing two threatening letters as evidence. The alleged issue is said to have been over the late Senate president's plans to visit Taiwan. More news has surfaced this week involving meddling by Beijing in the politics of the Czech Republic. After the sudden death in January of Senator Jaroslav Kubare, the president of the Czech Senate, his bereaved family went on television on January 27th and accused Czech President Milos Zeman, who is known to be pro-Beijing leaning, and Zhang Jianming, the Chinese ambassador to the Czech Republic, of threatening and obstructing Jaroslav Kubare from visiting Taiwan and of allegedly hounding him to death. This came at about the same time that displays of the June 4, 1989 Tiananmen Square massacre were exhibited on the streets of Prague, the capital of the Czech Republic, and reports that the city's mayor, Zednik Harib, was being protected by the police for two weeks because he was allegedly a target for poisoning for removing a statue from the Soviet Union. The accusations that pro-Beijing President Milos Zeman and Chinese Ambassador Zhang Jianming have hounded the late Senator Kibera to death with harassment and threats have caused a major political scandal in the Czech Republic. 
Senator Kibera was an important figure during the 1989 Velvet Revolution and has been the number two most important figure in the Czech Republic's constitutionalism. He was also very friendly with democratic Taiwan. Additionally, during his 2019 term, the Senate passed a resolution supporting religious groups in China, including the spiritual group Falun Gong, and calling on the Czech president to demand an end to religious persecution by the Chinese Communist Party. Kabira was scheduled to visit Taiwan in February, but died from a heart attack on January 20th. His wife, Vera, and his daughter accepted an interview with Czech television on April 27th accusing the presidential palace of the Czech Republic and the Chinese embassy in the Czech Republic of continuously threatening and pressuring Kibera to cancel the trip to Taiwan. On October 10, 2019, Kibera spoke at a Taiwan National Day celebration, saying, This is not my first time attending the National Day celebration of Taiwan. Thank you for inviting me. I wish the Taiwanese people all the best and admire them for their hard work and achievements. My heartfelt blessings to you all." His wife said in the interview that three days before he died, Kabira had a very unpleasant backroom meeting during the Chinese New Year's dinner, hosted by the Chinese ambassador. He even advised his wife not to eat the food provided by the Chinese embassy. After his death, when she and her daughter were sorting out her husband's belongings, they found in his briefcase two letters from the Czech Republic's presidential palace and the Chinese embassy. The letters were threatening in nature and meant to obstruct Kabira's visit to Taiwan, even reminding him to consider the safety of the Kabira family, according to his wife. His wife continued, saying that they were terrified after reading the letters and believed that these two letters were the reason for Kabira's death. She mentioned that Kabira was depressed and did not want to talk seven days before his death. However, he insisted on visiting Taiwan. He once told the family nobody was going to stop Kabira during the days of the communist dictatorship. Now that the Czech Republic is a democratic country, there is no reason to surrender to this type of pressure. The new president of the Senate, Milos Vistarchil, announced that he sent out three consecutive letters to Czech President Milos Zeman demanding an explanation for the two threatening letters that have caused a major scandal. However, President Zeman has rejected an invitation by Congress to answer questions and help investigate, he said. The FCC believes the Chinese regime could use state-run China Mobile for spying and intelligence gathering via U.S. phone networks. Ever since President Trump took office, he has imposed restrictions on companies under the influence of foreign governments. On April 24th, the FCC is requiring several Chinese-based telecom companies to declare that they are not subject to the influence, exploitation, and control by the Chinese regime. Recently, the FCC. Federal Communication Commission demanded that four Chinese state-owned telecommunication companies conducting business in the United States explain whether or not their operations are lawful. The FCC announced on April 24 that it is requiring China Telecom Americas, China Unicom Americas, Pacific Networks, and Comnet to declare within 30 days that they are not subject to the exploitation, influence, and control by the Chinese Communist Party. Otherwise, the FCC will revoke its licenses and authorization that allow them to operate in the United States. These telecommunication companies have been operating in the United States for more than 10 years. The commissioner of the FCC, Brendan Carr, said, The silencing of criticism from the CCP and the disappearances of doctors and citizen journalists both exacerbated the spread of the coronavirus, CCP virus, globally. The American people are experiencing the impacts of these oppressions as their lives now have been affected, losing their lives and jobs, and their children being unable to attend schools because of the virus. Because the CCP is willing to disappear its own people for further expanding and developing their geopolitics, it is only appropriate and reasonable for the FCC to carefully investigate telecommunication companies that have ties with that regime. Tom Cotton, senator from the Republican Party, praised the FCC for the investigation. He indicated that these companies are spies of the Chinese Communist Party, and their operations in the United States will continue to pose a threat to key U.S. networks. These four companies are considered to be under the influence and control of the Chinese Communist regime, 
and represent a threat to U.S. national security. The Trump administration's Interagency Telecommunications Regulatory Task Force, led by the Department of Justice, the Department of Homeland Security, the Department of Defense, and the Department of State, suggested that the FCC revoke the licenses of any foreign-controlled entities to end their operations in the United States. President Donald Trump established the task force with an executive order in April and appointed the members. Since Trump took office, he has changed the attitude towards foreign companies participating in the construction of U.S. telecommunications infrastructure. He has imposed administrative and legislative restrictions on companies that are influenced by foreign governments. Huawei, which is considered by the United States to have ties to the military of the Chinese Communist Party, has been a particular focus. The United States has banned Huawei from participating in the construction of U.S. 5G networks and also warned its allies of the national security threats posed by Huawei's 5G technology. In May 2019, the FCC voted unanimously to deny China Mobile a license to operate in the United States because of law enforcement and national security risks. The FCC believed that the Chinese regime could use state-run China Mobile for espionage and intelligence gathering through U.S. telephone networks. China has been hit hard by the pandemic, and the regime is trying to cover up the reality of the situation. China's manufacturing industry has been greatly affected, and the back-to-work policy is getting them nowhere. Guangzhou is China's export center. Buses that drove workers from Hubei to Guangzhou are now their homeward-bound buses. The video shows a red banner, Hubei Union supports back to work, still on the bus, even as it becomes a Hubei-bound bus loaded with factory parts and equipment. Chinese medicine suspected that the machines and machine parts these people were taking home with them were their severance packages because the factory owner did not have any cash to pay them. At this long-distance bus station, more than a thousand workers were seen boarding buses to return home every day. Pandemic hits China hard. Even though the regime tries to cover up the reality, people know the true situation. The pandemic has drastically affected China's manufacturing industry. The back-to-work policy is getting nowhere due to the lack of overseas orders and materials. Twin brothers Michael and Dennis Dorso are both ER doctors. One lives in New York City and the other in Miami. The brothers discuss their experiences working as ER doctors on the front lines treating patients infected with the CCP virus. From when we were kids, we realized we were similarly talented at pretty much everything and kind of having the same interests, we were forced to have, you know, active or, you know, more subtle competition and everything. And that still continues. Twin brothers, Dennis and Michael Durso, had done almost everything together for 30 years. And even today, though 1,300 miles apart, they have the same mission, keep COVID-19 patients alive. Dennis is an ER doctor in Miami. Michael is an ER doctor in New York, the U.S. epicenter of the coronavirus outbreak. Yeah, I think in Miami, we're still bracing for impact. So in general, we're learning lessons from places like New York. And I get to learn lessons from my brother who's personally experiencing it. The twins say they check in with each other almost every day. We get to share things that we learn day to day. We see unique patient cases and share how we responded to them and took care of these patients. 
or just getting different experiences at different hospitals and how, how different programs are training and preparing for this kind of response. Michael's main lesson for Dennis, expect the unexpected. He has told his twin horror stories about how seemingly stable patients may crash without warning. I just feel like every day you get home and you just want to sit down and just let it all out for a few minutes because it is so much more stressful than your regular days at work. While the coronavirus crisis brings strain on the brothers, the emergency room is essentially the family business. Their dad, James, was an ER doctor for 35 years. Oh, yes, yes, we're very proud of them. Yes. Can't say enough about it. Yeah, I think they went into a real good profession, and every time they call us every day, they kind of vent uh, about all the exciting things they had to go through during the night and the real bad uh, critical cases and some uh, just very interesting type uh, cases. And I think it's very rewarding when they get off a shift and know that they've taken care of a lot of people and made a big difference in their lives. Dennis says the pandemic provides experience that no medical school could. And while they may be separated by states, the two say this experience has brought them closer than ever. President Trump stated yesterday that people want the country to reopen. He said there is danger in being confined indoors and there's a lot of pressure on governors. Trump mentioned that we've now learned a lot about the CCP virus and how to handle it. We talked about it and very strongly Josh mentioned safety, have to have safety. But at the same time, people want this country open. The people here want it open. And there is a danger to uh, too much uh, being confined to a house or an apartment or wherever you live. You, you can't it just we got to start moving along. And with all of the testing we're doing, with all of the things we're doing, uh, you can do this now. And, and governors are actually, a lot of pressure is being put on governors right now by the people in their states. They want to get it open. And that's what you want. That's what we all want. And with all of the procedures and safety, we've learned a lot about this uh, hidden enemy. We've learned a lot. And there'll be pockets of fire, and we'll put them out. We'll put them out very, very quickly. But, you know, during this period of time, uh, I think we've really learned a tremendous amount about how to handle it. Nothing easy, but we want safety. So we want safety and we want economic, where people can go and make a great living and go back to living the way. I mean, you had people, we had wonderful people in yesterday where the business was going to be lost other than what we did, Steve, with the great programs that we set up. The following charts will show you the most recent numbers regarding the CCP virus pandemic. However, China and Iran are not included because their numbers are unverifiable. In Geneva, Switzerland, in response to the lockdown and rain, a few residents of an apartment building have been meeting on their balconies to sing, dance, and play games. I'm happy again. Neighbors living in the apartment of the Roundhouse, a century-old housing block, get together around 6 p.m. to take part in the nightly choir. Every day, one of the residents is given the task of conducting the festivities by choosing songs, dances, and games. In accordance with the weather, Tuesday's theme was rain. Members of the choir were equipped with umbrellas and raincoats and sang songs, including Singing in the Rain by Gene Kelly or The Umbrella by French singer Georges Brassens. Four similar blocks built by Maurice Berlard in the late 1920s make up the neighborhood of the Roundhouse. Their original semicircle shape allows the residents to see each other from their balconies. They've even learned each other's birthdays. This activity has helped bring neighbors closer together. Audrey, the MC on Tuesday said, the great adventure brought the people of the neighborhood closer together than they were before. 
dancing and singing It's Raining Men by the Weather Girls from her balcony on the second floor, 75-year-old Danielle Salins said the experience helped her forget the news. The residents are planning to continue their daily performance until May 11th, the day schools are set to reopen. That's all for today. Don't forget to like, subscribe, and share this program with friends and family to keep them informed about the latest news and updates. Thank you for joining me. See you next time.